So without further ado, Bill Doherty. Okay, good morning, everyone. I um, flew in from Minnesota and uh, said to the cab driver, boy, nice weather here. He said, it's a cold spell. Uh, and so for me, this is perfect, perfect spell. Um, what I'm going to do is to uh, talk about the uh, research case for the Second Chances proposal. And we've introduced this term unnecessary divorce, which of course implies that some divorces are necessary. Um, uh, and what I want to talk about are the, some of the assumptions, cultural and for a while academic assumptions, behind divorce uh, that have uh, driven the status quo uh, around this, this topic. Uh, the first is, the first uh, belief is that uh, most divorces occur in marriages that are marked by bitter conflict over many years and that are thus best ended. Um, the research in the last uh, 10 or 15 years has put the lie to that notion. Uh, we've, we now have a generation of studies that have been able to follow people during their marriage uh, through the divorce and afterwards. And what those studies have been showing is that the average divorce, depending on the study, half to two-thirds of divorces uh, with children, that's, that's been the, the main area of focus of these studies, the average divorce occurs in a marriage that two years before was an average marriage in terms of happiness, reasonably low levels of conflict, average marital satisfaction scores or happiness scores. And something happened within a couple year period that propelled them uh, to divorce. Um, it's um, less than half, depending on the study, a third to a half of those marriages, again with children, which is our main emphasis here, uh, were those uh, bitter, uh, long-term, going downhill, um, uh, uh, poisonous environment for everyone in the household. Um, Related to that is the research that's showing that the majority of divorces that are occurring now, children and with children and not, are for what I call the soft reasons for divorce. <clears throat> the hard reasons, um, the research showed if you go back a generation, were chronic infidelity, untreated alcoholism, abuse, uh, the kinds of reasons that um, uh, that, that make it uh, almost impossible for somebody to be healthy in that environment. But there's been a shift uh, towards what I call the soft reasons. In our own research, uh, growing apart and lack of communication are the two uh, main reasons, the two top-rated reasons for parents with minor children to get divorced. Now, this can be a source of pain for people, but these are what I call the soft reasons that are very much related to contemporary high expectations uh, and they, all, they usually involve both people having pretty uh, equal contribution to the lack of uh, growing together and, and communication. Um, and th the third part of this first piece of the research is that the, the new research is showing that children are most harmed by the divorces to those average marriages and the soft reasons for divorce the children are actually being reasonably well taken care of in those relationships, and the bottom falls out. Children in the toxic war zone marriages, when those break up, the children do better. But we used to think, and this is again part of the myth, we used to think that most divorces were the toxic war. Now, some of them can get that way, and we'll be talking about that in a minute, once they get into the divorce process. Uh, but if you actually uh, look at these, these marriages uh, prior, in the years prior to, the, the divorces that look the most preventable, the soft reasons, not, not, not the abusive marriages, uh, the ones that had a, a reasonably good track record for a long time, those look to be the most preventable divorces, and those are the ones that children are most harmed by when they break up. So the, the first is that uh, is this, uh, the research belying some traditional notions of what the average divorce is. The second has to do with this whole new uh, body of research on the ongoing effects of instability in the lives of children. So we used to think that if the parents were civilized about this, if they, 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 they did well, they got along well, put the kids' needs first, um, uh, the good divorce, uh, that those children were going to do fine. 
Now, they do better, of course, than if the children are hostile and put the kids in the middle. But there's this new research that's showing the independent effect of multiple transitions in the lives of children. The adults move on in their lives. They have new boyfriends and girlfriends. They have new cohabiting partners. They have new spouses. And they have higher breakup rates of all of those relationships. The children go through other kids coming in and out of their lives. Step, you know, it's hard enough to get along with siblings, let alone step-siblings. And so the, the research in the last decade has been showing the cumulative effect of transitions even when the parents are doing well together with each other. Okay? So that second principle, second uh, notion that I think we could put the lie to is that the kids are going to be fine if the adults just cooperate. Obviously, they have to cooperate. But the, the cumulative effects of these transitions, because what happens is the trajectory of adults and children begin to diverge. Children, by and large, want stability. And once a marriage breaks up, adults are usually looking for new relationships, which unfortunately, early on, are ten, tend not to be stable. The, th the third issue is the notion that when people file for divorce, the, 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 the belief that once people file, game over, uh, get them out of their marital misery and, and go through a divorce. And the whole uh, court system it tends to be set up to expedite uh, divorces uh, and to minimize conflict. Um, certainly for minimizing conflict, the expediting is based on the notion it's over once they file. Uh, and the research that um, my uh, colleagues Brian Willoughby and uh, Judge Bruce Peterson published recently that's one of the basis of this report, again, put the light of that notion. Uh, Judge Peterson, uh, the family court in Hennepin County, approached me um, uh, several years ago saying he met with a, a number of couples who seemed to be getting along so darn well divorcing, he wondered why they weren't still married. Uh, that to do a divorce really well takes high levels of communication, respect, and sensitivity. Uh, and he was wondering sometimes if he and his wife, you know, who were happily married, could divorce well. Um, and he asked me, was there any research on ambivalence about going through the divorce or interest in reconciliation among pe people who had already filed? There was no research, so we did it. And we gathered research on 2,500 divorcing parents in Hennepin County through a very nice sample because they had to take classes and we got them at the end of the classes, so it was a very good sample. Uh, and we found that at the, at the individual parent level, 30% uh, of the parents um, uh, uh, said yes or maybe to the question, would you, be, would you seriously consider reconciliation services if those were made available by the court? And the question about whether you thought your marriage could be saved, 25% said they thought their marriage could still be saved even at this point. When we put them together as couples, when we matched them as couples, 10% of the couples in the divorce process independently surveyed uh, both spouses said they would seriously consider reconciliation services. And these were people one step away from the divorce decree. When we started to ask about where they were in that process, the earlier you go, the, the more upstream you go from filing, the higher the, in, the interest in the possibility of reconciliation. Um, so this was quite uh, stunning. Uh, these were quite stunning findings. They're being replicated in Georgia, by the way. It's not just a Minnesota fluke. Um, and uh, we're now doing research in divorce lawyers' offices, and it's about 50% of people who walk in divorce uh, lawyers' offices who, who, who think their marriage could still be saved. So we have, I believe, put the lie to a third assumption that, that would say that we ought not to deform, uh, 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 reform divorce laws because it's a done deal once people follow, uh, file for a divorce. So implications then that uh, for this report that you're going to be hearing about from Justice Sears, our proposals, is that there are many unnecessary preventable divorces. So hear me and hear us. There are necessary divorces. There are, there are, uh, we're not out to end divorce in this country. Uh, we're not out in this modest proposal to abolish uh, no-fault divorce. We're really suggesting some modest reforms because we believe that there are preventable divorces uh, and that children are most harmed by those divorces that are preventable. Uh, and that secondly, in terms of implications, the state has an interest in this. 
The state's primary interest here is the welfare of children who have no say in this, who have no say in the subsequent tr transitions their parents go through. And we believe that uh, divorce reform, although it's brought some good things uh, over the last uh, 40 years or so, there are some big blind spots and some big holes uh, that we need to uh, fill, and that's what we're proposing. Thank you. Well, Bill, thank you for that very concise and lucid summary of the research base of the proposal. And now for the proposal itself, Justice Sears. Oh, thank, thank you very much, and it's, it's good to be here. Uh, what I'm going to do, and I think you did a very good job, Bill, of concisely going through the basis of the research, and I will try to be concise when I outline the list of our recommendations uh, to give people who desire divorces a second chance through this uh, Second Chances Act. But before I get started on the recommendations, I want to echo what Bill said. This is a modest proposal, not designed to in any way get in divorce or in no fault, uh, and these are to p p potentially save unnecessary divorces for the benefit of our children, because I'm asked that over and over again. It is a modest, uh, modest proposal. So here is the list of recommendations for giving married couples a second chance. Number one, it would involve extending the waiting period in which to get a divorce. There is a considerable variation among the states today uh, in the time period that uh, couples have to wait in order to finalize their divorces. These waiting periods range from zero uh, to two years. I mean, I know in my state it's 30 days. Uh, we are recommending in this report that states adopt a, at least a one year from the date of filing for divorce a waiting period before the divorce becomes final. Now you may be asking why one year? While some states with very low divorce rates have a two year waiting period, Massachusetts is, is one of those states. And while we believe that that's probably a good idea, we believe that as a general and threshold rule, a minimum of one year is really needed to give couples a chance to decide if they really, really want to go through with their divorce. Now, some might suggest that uh, any amount of time is unnecessary and unfair, and, and why not let people just go ahead and decide for themselves what it is that they want to do? Uh, here's the reason why that doesn't work out so well, and I can tell you it doesn't work out so well from my 23 years as I sit as a, a judge in the, in the courts of Georgia. First, the law carries meaning about what it is we actually value as a society. That is to say, if family stability and the well-being of our children are really the high public values that we say they are, then states should adopt rules that reflect the same, such as requiring a cooling off period long enough for both spouses to consider other options. Furthermore, divorces are the severing of contractual agreements. If it's not unusual for contract law to provide for a waiting period to protect consumers from decisions that they have made in haste in a sales pitch, i.e. to buy a car or something, then why is it not unreasonable for our public policy to dictate at least the same, if not more, in terms of getting a divorce and severing that contract? Second, the dis decision to divorce often comes at the most intensely emotional period of a person or a couple's life. Uh, they may feel betrayed by something that the spouse did. They may be in the throes of another romantic relationship. They ha may have health or job concerns or, or deeply depressed. People in hot states of emotion are prone, prone to make very, very costly decisions, particularly when they are just simply not equipped with the tools or the information. And with a mandatory waiting period, chances are a lot higher that the outcome will be better if the, a couple is afforded more time along with the tools during that time in which to make a much more informed decision. Third, and I can attest to this, the law moves couples rapidly towards divorce more than perhaps they had initially intended or expected. 
very short waiting periods combined with little or no help for exiting the divorce superhighway is what we call it, leaves very little possibility for either spouse to consider reconciliation. You know, some spouses just used filing for a divorce as, as, a, as a threat to get to the other spouse's attention. But before they know it, they're caught up in the, in the, the turbulence of the divorce process, and they're propelled toward a divorce that they really didn't, weren't sure that they, they really wanted. Even if one spouse is determined not to reconcile, however, there are good reasons to think that the pace of divorce should actually follow the spouse who is less willing to divorce. Pushing a reluctant spouse to move too quickly can increase chances of conflict and litigation during the divorce, can exacerbate, can exacerbate post-divorce conflict, and uh, can and can really hurt uh, hot button issues such as children and, and money and, and time. Now, of course, domestic violence situations are special and they are a special concern to the entire, to all of us and to the entire judiciary and they must and can be handled with the waiver of the waiting period in those cases in which the immediate threat to a spouse or children is present. So we're not ignoring uh, those kinds of uh, situations where divorce is necessary. Lastly, the public generally thinks that making divorces involving children should be somewhat harder to get. The polling has consistently shown that Americans favor more speed bumps, if you will, on the road to divorce for, for couples who have children. You could just look at New York and the New York's recent example when they revamped their divorce laws. There was very little pushback when the six-month waiting period was instituted as, uh, as part of the divorce reform in New York. Now, we are also, as part of this Second Chances Act, proposing requiring the spouse moving for divorce to give the other spouse pre-filing notice. Before they file for divorce, they must notify the other spouse that they're going to move for divorce. Filing a legal action with the court while an important option is not really likely to be a good pathway to initiate marital reconciliation. And so to create an alternative pathway, we're proposing this early warning notification process. The idea here is that a spouse who wants to raise serious concerns but also preserve the marriage will have a structured process using a legally recognized document that's in this material that we're handing out to inform his or her partner that the divorce is a clear risk unless they both work on solving their problems. Now, the interesting thing is this document can substitute for divorce filing as one way to initiate the one year, the one year waiting period. Uh, might, who might use such an early notification and prevention letter? Well, some spouses just want to get the other spouse's attention. There's love there. There's commitment there. They just really want to work on, on problems. And uh, that would be very handy in, in a case like that. Now, although some divorces will likely be prevented with waiting periods and the early notification device, we also believe that more can be prevented if couples can learn new skills and connect with resources in the community to improve their marriages. That's why the proposed new statute also has a provision for education and reconciliation services or counseling or reconciliation education. Now, given that we already have thousands of therapists who do marriage counseling in every state, some might ask why, you know, we already have this, why is, is what we're proposing different? Yes, it is. We feel that many therapists practicing, practicing marriage counseling in this country today are not really adequately trained for this kind of difficult therapy. Although an estimated 80% of therapists in private practice report they do at least some marital therapy, most mental health therapists uh, don't really have a degree or recertification programs and don't have specific training in marriage therapy. Also, it's an open secret among experienced practitioners of marriage counseling that 
even those who do very, very good individual counseling can be poor marriage counselors. The result is that such therapists fail to treat often conflicted or demoralized couples. Moreover, today's therapists typically feel that they should hold a neutral stance towards whether or not the marriage survives or ends in divorce. Divorcing or staying married are seen as equally valid outcomes, much as one might view whether you stay in a job or move into a different job. Hence, some counselors do not work vigorously to, to restore marriages, and that's what we'd like to see. We further recommend that states require completion of a parent education course before either spouse files for divorce, specifically before any legal divorce work is filed. Both parties would have to take a course that would teach communication and conflict resolution skills, as well as offer reconciliation information and services. We also believe that states should provide couples with marriage education options that could help prevent divorce down the road. Now, marriage education programs have been used for decades in the United States, and they have a demonstrated track record in helping to improve and save marriages. Marriage education aims to equip people with knowledge, skills, attitudes, everything, hopefully, necessary to be a success in a marriage. And the fifth and final piece of our modest proposal concerns the creation of centers of excellence to develop state capacity to help couples at risk. These centers would focus on providing public information and training professionals who would work with couples considering divorce. They could also promote the best marriage therapy models and best marriage education programs currently available. State universities obviously are logical places to house these centers, although a stable nonprofit agency could be a good choice as well. Some examples of what these centers of excellence could do are develop best practices for lawyers on the front line of the divorce practice, work with clergy who have agreed to develop and disseminate best practices for working with crisis marriages and religious communities, offer discernment counseling for couples who have started or who are seriously considering the divorce process, but one or both spouses just really isn't sure that the divorce is the right thing for them. Ladies and gentlemen, these interacting and mutually reinforcing reforms that I've just outlined in brief constitutes one piece of a model act, model legislation, which we're calling the Second Chances Act. And we are willing and willing to work to see that the Second Chances Act becomes a law in every state. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that very lucid presentation of a deceptively modest proposal. <laughs> yeah. and, and now for, you know, and now for our skilled commentators, starting with Robert Reckler. I'm going to talk about uh, the reasons that society and, and the government uh, should be involved in the effort to, uh, to preserve and strengthen marriage in our society. And uh, I'm going to start with my favorite welfare expert, Lyndon Baines Johnson, and go back to the point that when Johnson launched the war on poverty back in 1964, he, he clearly said that uh, he didn't want to just deal with the symptoms of poverty, but more importantly, he wanted to deal with the causes of poverty. And his goal was not uh, very clearly to, he actually said he wanted to reduce the welfare state. He wanted to make the poor prosperous and self-sufficient through their own abilities and skills. And if we were to look at this 50 years later, at the principal causes of poverty as well as of welfare dependence, we find the decline of marriage is the overwhelmingly strongest factor. Uh, both in terms of the number of births that occur non-maritally, as well as the instability of marriages and, and subsequent divorce. If you were to go in every state in the United States, uh, you see that between 65 and 70 percent 
of the poor families with children are non-married uh, single parent families or no parent families. Uh, in many states it's 75 percent. It's the, it, almost the entire child poverty problem in these states is the result of the absence of marriage in homes. Similarly, if you look across every state, you find that the probability of child poverty is about 80 percent less in married couple families than it is in single parent families. It is the overwhelming single strongest factor. In fact, uh, <clears throat> marriage is more effective in terms of reducing the probability of child poverty than is uh, the parent graduating from high school. It's a rather remarkable statistic, but it's actually true. And that if you were to just put this into a regression, being married uh, in terms of the reducing the probability of poverty is the equivalent of adding five or six years of education to, to both parents. It's an incredibly strong factor, which we largely don't uh, talk about. But if we were to go back to Johnson's original goal of, um, in the war of poverty, which was to make families prosperous and self-sufficient through their own abilities, through their own initiatives, by reducing the causes of poverty, this, we, we have to look at the single strongest reason why poverty occurs among children, and that is the erosion of marriage over the last 50 years. Similarly, and not surprisingly, when you look at the means-tested welfare state with over 70 programs designed to assist poor people, you find that the overwhelming bulk of assistance going to families with children is going to single parent families, probably 65 to 70 percent. And I would estimate that at the pre this year, we spent about $350 billion in means-tested aid to single parent families. Not to say that this aid isn't needed, but that the state has a fairly compelling reason to at least investigate and think about why the need for that assistance occurs and whether there might be some way to mitigate uh, the, the growth of the need for that assistance by looking at the, the reason that we have so many single parent families in the first place. Similarly, if you were to look at the overall fiscal structure, we find that single parent families looking at all government services and taxes pay, receive about $3 worth of government benefits for every dollar of taxes they pay in. So basic society pays a very large cost for the decline and erosion of marriage. In many cases, this is inevitable and unavoidable. But I believe that in some cases it's not and that society has both a fiscal reason as well as an overriding social reason in terms of the well-being of the children and the parents as well to try to take steps to uh, strengthen uh, the, the institution of marriage and to, str and to increase the probability that parents can live and remain in healthy marriages. Uh, and one clear <coughs> aspect of that would be to try to look at those divorces which we're identifying as not necessary divorces and to find a way to encourage the, uh, those parents to remain together for the well-being of the child, for the well-being of the parents themselves, I happen to believe, and also for the well-being of society and, and the final, for the well-being of the taxpayer who ultimately would benefit from such a policy. Uh, I think that this proposal lay, is laid out as a very good one. It's a non-coercive policy and I think in many cases is really just an enabling tool to, to help uh, some couples, not all, but some couples basically deal with issues in a, in a way that <coughs> has currently been neglected. Uh, and I'm very, in particular, uh, interested in the provision of marriage education at an earlier point in the process, and I happen to believe that those types of programs can be extremely effective in, uh, in terms of uh, reducing uh, conflict within marriages and, in fact, raising the quality of life in those households. And I, I think that uh, it's, it's sad in our society that we just let uh, the, this process fall apart a and <clears throat> without doing much of anything to help couples deal with the problems that they do have. 
society has the institution of marriage for a reason, because we believe as a society that marriage is, is the best institution, particularly for raising children. And therefore, we need to basically take steps, modest, non-coercive steps, in order to strengthen that institution. If we do not believe that the institution is worth saving, that we cannot do things to help couples reconcile, it sort of begs the question as to why we bother to have this institution at all. Uh, if it's, if it's uh, of no value that you can get rid of it in, in uh, zero days or 30 days whatsoever, wh why do we even bother to have it at all? But I think implicitly we understand that it's an extremely valuable institution and we have, we have degraded it uh, over the last 50 years, treating it as, as not having the value, which if you step back and look at the, the overwhelming social consequences, particularly for children when marriage does fall apart or never forms in the first place, it's, it's quite clear that it is an astonishingly important institution. And I, I truly commend this modest step to, uh, to strengthen that institution. Thanks, Robert. Theodora? Um, delighted to be here. Hit your button. Oh. I'm delighted to be here, and Bill asked me to do the cleanup work, which means I think that I will not um, underscore and repeat. I'll try not to underscore all the many things that were said by the other panelists, with most, much of which I really agreed with. I think you all did a terrific job. So I'll try to say some things which perhaps haven't been said. Um, but overall, I do think this is a very thoughtful and well-developed proposal. Um, I like the general direction, the concepts. I think we need to discuss and debate them. It's a very complex subject, but I do think this shouldn't stop us from trying to go forward with experimenting with and learning from making some of these changes that have been suggested. I'm going to talk briefly about why this proposal, however, is going to be very likely to be resisted strongly by the domestic violence community and its supporters, and what, if anything, can be done to meet their concerns. And I also have some other recommendations about the proposal. But Bill Galston wanted me to first provide a little historical context for those who may not be familiar with what's been going on with um, the, uh, the marriage and divorce agenda in, in the policy context. Just to remind you that marriage and divorce has traditionally been an issue for state legislatures and courts to deal with. In the 70s, as noted, following California's lead in 69, all states have now enacted no-fault divorce laws. In the 90s, however, in response to some of the data and concern that's been described, states and communities launched various modest initiatives to strengthen marriage and reduce and discourage divorce which in the view of most people had become too easy. Marriage and divorce are now for the first time on the federal policy agenda. The 1996 federal welfare reform law, which my colleague on my left had a lot to do with, as well as other people in the room, was the first federal law to explicitly state that promoting marriage and two-parent families and reducing out-of-wedlock births should be the goals of public policy. In 2002, under the Bush administration, Health and Human Services Department started funding marriage education services using various discretionary funds. And I should make a little note, marriage education is really rather different from, although it overlaps with marriage therapy and counseling. It's more preventative, it's usually given in groups, it's education focused. So if somebody says, I've been there, done that, I've seen a therapist, that's not the same. In 2005, the Congress reauthorized the welfare program and, importantly, added a new grants program specifically to fund these healthy marriage and responsible fatherhood programs. And altogether, around 300 healthy marriage programs have been funded all over the U.S. And uh, just recently, on October 1st, another 60 were funded. The aim of the majority of these programs and the state initiatives was to prevent divorce through focusing on the front end, promoting healthy marriage, through providing individuals and couples of all ages with the information and skills training to help them make wise marriage choices and have healthy, long-lasting marriages. And very few of these government-funded programs were targeted at the back end, namely married couples on the brink of divorce. Um, we've talked briefly about 
excuse me, um, uh, no-fault divorce laws, and there have been various proposals to undo them or modify them, but I think they've generally been considered quite toxic and have not, not become law. There have also been many attempts to enact covenant marriage laws, which is a modest reform offering couples the option of choosing a type of marriage contract that would make it hard, somewhat harder to get out of. And these covenant laws have only passed in three states, Louisiana, Arizona, and Arkansas. Now, the second chances proposal, I think, disarms a good bit of the opposition to divorce reform by proposing to change the law only with respect to divorcing couples with children and focusing on the concept of unnecessary divorce, as has been very well described. Um, these seem much more reasonable and less threatening grounds upon which to build a divorce reform proposal than arguing about the appropriate grounds for divorce, who should be, uh, whether divorces should be available if only one party wants to divorce, or how the assets should be divided, because that's been part of the argument. Now, numerous objections can and will be raised about some of the details of, the, of these and other similar proposals, and there are other similar ones. Um, the Coalition for Divorce Reform has a proposal that shares some common elements with this one about how they would work in different circumstances and about whether the funding is there to provide some of these necessary education and counseling services. But as I said, we can expect considerable objections are going to be raised by members of the domestic violence community and its supporters. Uh, the resource center I work for the, has had a strong five-year collaborative relationship with national and state do domestic violence leaders. And Anne Menard, who was a key and influential leader in the domestic violence um, community and runs the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence, and she unfortunately couldn't be here today, made a number of points to me after she reviewed a draft of the other proposal, the Parental Divorce Reduction Act. I'm not sure that she's seen this one. Domestic violence advocates are, in general, she says, very worried about any kind of barrier to divorce placed in front of individuals who are mostly women in abusive marriages who have a legitimate and serious reason to end their marriage. Now, both the, the Parental Divorce Reduction Act and the Second Chances Act make an effort to be sensitive to this issue of domestic violence by, of course, emphasizing that some divorces are necessary and including upfront exemption for those couples where there is a permanent protective domestic violence order in place or a conviction for domestic violence. Now, Anne reports that these exceptions are not sufficient. They don't recognize that many women trying to get out of violent and abusive marriages do not want to disclose the violence and don't make an official report for a number of reasons. Among them, they know that many women who do report are then treated quite horribly by the courts such disclosures can further anger the abusive partner, lead to a, an exacerbation of the violence of the abuse, and or make him even more interested in fighting for custody of their children. So in such cases, Anne believes that requiring further delay could really do harm, and time for reconsideration and reconciliation services is irrelevant. But the question is, how can we identify and deal with these hard cases? And how can these and other objections uh, domestic violence community may raise be met. Now, I believe any state legislator or advocate promoting divorce reform, such as this proposal, should reach out and consult with state domestic violence leaders every step of the way, including in the early drafting of the law. Importantly, there should be ongoing consultation with state DV experts as a required part of the law, of its implementation. You need to build trust and listen to each other. You can't expect the DV community to become active supporters of these divorce reforms if you do this, but they will and can work with you to help make the law work better, figure out together how to approach these hard cases, and allay some of their worst fears. Now, my, this isn't just my fantasy. This has been going on for five years. We've had expensive, extensive experience with this in the federally funded healthy marriage programs, because in that program, there's a requirement in the law that all the grantees must consult with their local domestic violence um, experts and develop a protocol for how to deal with this issue in their programs. This requirement has been taken quite seriously and has, for the most part, worked well. It has led to setting up cross-training activities that have been quite fascinating and led to mutual referrals back and forth 
and created a degree of mutual trust and acceptance in many, though not all, communities between healthy marriage and domestic violence programs. And this is true of the Responsible Fatherhood programs, too. Um, just a word about the research. Uh, there is sufficient research to move forward. You've been very persuasive. But I do think we have to recognize there's still a lot we don't know. Um, Doherty's study of divorcing Minnesotans and your new program, Couples on the Brink, are a major exciting contribution to the field. But it needs to be replicated on a broader scale and more, more diverse populations. After all, Minnesotans, as Garrison Keeler regularly informs us, are very exceptional. <laughs> Just, I also just above average, just <laughs> above average. I also recommend that a state would be wise to experiment with this proposal first on a pilot basis, perhaps starting with two or three counties and then carefully evaluate it. I don't know if that could be done, but it would make a lot of sense. We need to know what works and get a chance to modify the details before we move forward. Now, timing is everything. Some people, as has been said, believe the problem with many of these proposals, they come too late in the process, and um, when they've, uh, that, that argument has been made well. So thus, I'm intrigued by the idea incorporated into the second chance proposal. I think it was originally John Crouch's idea uh, about the early notification and divorce prevention letter prior to the start um, of the divorce proceedings. I assume that this letter should be filed with an official somewhere, and that it would then trigger the one year delay, and I think you've agreed with that. This would seem to make sense, but I don't know how it would work out. It's something we have to try. I also might want to word the letter differently. I had some problems with the way it was worded, but the idea is a very good one. It would get the spouse's attention and maybe steer them in the direction. Particularly if you go one step further, filing this letter, I think, should trigger automatically some basic information and education to all parents considering divorce. And this shouldn't be considered um, controversial, we have the concept in this country of informed consent. Um, and I think it, if we use this phrase, it might make it more acceptable. In healthcare, for example, before we go for any kind of surgery or procedure, we have to have and uh, show that we have, our, have been informed and have given our consent to the choice we make. Oh, well, when children are involved, divorce is indeed a type of social emotional surgery, in my view. So it should be easy to understand why we should require that the parties seeking a divorce need to be informed about what is involved in getting a divorce, how long it may take, it can take a long time, what the risks, I mean, quite apart from the, the official delay, is it can take a long time because of the contentiousness of it. Um, what the risks and unanticipated consequences are for all the parties, but especially for children, and what kinds of alternatives, such as reconciliation services, are available that they have not yet tried. I think this shouldn't be a kind of option. I think this should be almost required that people are given this kind of information when they say they're seriously considering divorce. Now, maybe this is a pat paternal patronizing thing, but think about it. And there are a handful of states who already um, are working on giving people information and requiring preparation. The churches, anyway, are requiring preparation before they marry. There are four states that give all couples who um, apply for a marriage license a guide to marriage to tell them what's involved and how they can try to be successful. They consider it a success if couples back off when they see that what is involved. Now, this proposal, I think another um, suggestion of mine, is that there really should be a strong emphasis on the importance of including resources for educating and training all the lawyers and clerks and other people who will implement it. Bill, I think, has done a great service in describing, and, and you also, just this, how the marriage and divorce lawyers and therapists have shifted from an attitude of, let's first see if we can consider how to save your marriage, to a let's help you get your divorce over quickly stance. But Doherty and Justice Sears don't include a component for investing in education and training the legal professions who will have to implement the bill. Now, it'll make it more expensive, but that's the way. That is what will be needed. And I say this because I was very impressed when the um, National Science Foundation funded study of the implementation of the Louisiana Covenant Law, which was a fairly serious attempt, discovered that the marriage clerks who were key to implementation of the law 
either didn't know about the law, didn't agree with it, or actively worked to undermine it. No surprising, not many people availed themselves of the contract and it didn't seem to make much difference. They had been given no serious training whatsoever. They'd just been told, this is what you should do. Finally, I'd like to suggest that advocates try to broaden the support for these proposals by finding common ground with others, we've heard a lot of it today, and making alliances even with strange bedfellows across partisan lines. I thought the E.J. Dion's um, op-ed piece this week complimenting Rick Santorum's efforts to make these issues was a very nice example of finding common grounds across partisan lines. It was in the Washington Post, for those of you who didn't see it. Regrettably, I think if those who work actively to introduce the bill are identified as religious conservatives, however thoughtful and reasonable their proposal is, it's likely to be dismissed out of hand by moderates, liberals, feminists, and so forth. We live in Washington, we know what happens, but I think it happens in the states too. Thus, I end with a general plea for working collaboratively. A menu of similarly focused divorce reform proposals is beginning to emerge. They need to be regarded as general templates to be adapted, not as final blueprints. And as you and others work on putting forward the second chances proposal in the state legislatures, I hope that you will collaborate with others who have who have and will develop similar proposals, highlighting what they have in common rather than emphasizing their differences. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Theodora. And thanks to the entire panel. This is about as good as it gets. You know, thoughtful, research-based proposals, uh, seriously considered uh, and, you know, critiqued not with an idea to devastating them, but with an idea to improving them and making them more workable and more broadly supported. Uh, I have a few questions of my own, but before I, before I get to them, uh, I'd like to give the authors of the report an opportunity to respond to the friendly advice and suggestions that you've received in the past few minutes. I, I would like to respond just briefly about the uh, the domestic violence proposals or discussion. I have, having worked in the trenches, I know very well that the DV community can put up quite a block, a legitimate block, and that that will be something that we'll have to work with very, very carefully to collaborate on, and and uh, again, collaborating across partisan lines is going to be absolutely necessary to get this uh, proposal passed, to get this or something similar passed. So I, uh, I want to echo that. Yeah, also, I, uh, what I liked, uh, Theo, is that you made, uh, you pointed out the weakness and then you suggested ways to do it. And I think, I think building in requirements about that consultation. And in fact, in Minnesota, where we're a little farther ahead on this, we are actively consulting. With, uh, and and uh, a bill that we have now has language that was mutually agreed upon with some DV uh, experts. So I think that's a really important thing. Um, we, we do in the, uh, the centers of excellence uh, idea, uh, we do, uh, one of the things that those centers uh, can do, and I have one in Minnesota, uh, is uh, train uh, lawyers and therapists and clergy. Because uh, I, uh, I have been a student, as you were suggesting, of failed experiments uh, where um, it's passed by the legislature and nobody actually does anything on the ground. Um, and uh, we just, just as an FYI, we, we have a Minnesota Couples on the Brink project, which is a center of excellence for the, developing the capacity of professionals in the state to um, educators, therapists, lawyers, clergy, to uh, respond to people who, who need uh, help on the brink. And we funded this uh, with a $5 surcharge on marriage license fees. Uh, and, the, uh, and this passed our legislature without a single negative vote. Uh, the idea is we know that a, a, a good fraction of newly marrying couples are, will be at risk for divorce. They, a, a number of them will be on the brink someday, sad to say. And uh, the idea is a permanent surcharge, which is $5, uh, to bring in some modest permanent funding for the development of the capacity of the state to respond to those. So the argument worked, uh, and we have a permanent center 
uh, and we are doing that, that kind of training. So I, I want to underline that if, if we're only talking about delaying divorce without these resources, I would not be for it. I think it's a package. Uh, it's a waiting period, and then what can go on uh, during that waiting period. And the, the centers of excellence is, is really a very important piece of this. Uh, I train marriage uh, counselors and therapists, and so I speak about my own profession in the world of therapy, and it's bad out there. Uh, a lot of folks don't know how to help these couples, and we need to develop the resources for them. Well, we have about another f five minutes of panel discussion before we, uh, before we move to the allotted 25 minutes for audience participation. And so I'd just like to pose two questions. Uh, question, question number one. Uh, I think there's broad agreement on the panel that the principal, though perhaps not sole state interest in this issue, has to do with the well-being of minor children. Uh, and in the course of the initial presentations, uh, several panelists have alluded to the wide range of consequences of divorce, particularly in this unnecessary category on minor children. And I think, it might, I think it might be useful to explore the research base of that proposition a little bit more thoroughly. We've heard a little bit about the financial and programmatic consequences. What do we know about the psychological and social consequences for minor children, and how solid is that research base? Yeah, it's, it's um, as solid as anything we have in the social sciences. Um, and it's been getting uh, better over time. Um, uh, particularly the generation of longitudinal studies, uh, uh, both in the United States and other countries, that have looked at a wide range of child outcomes. For instance, uh, we know that children's academic uh, achievement, both in school and later, uh, is affected by the divorce. And by the way, uh, the, 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 the good studies are now controlling for pre-divorce factors. Because one, they, always the issue in this research is the selection hypothesis versus the causal hypothesis. Were these kids going to have trouble anyway because they happen to have parents, whether they stayed married or not, were not, you know, were, had, had challenges. And so it, it, the, the, the generation of studies that have followed uh, families for 20 years, 25 years, have, before they broke up, have been able to establish that there are these deleterious effects on average, um, controlling for, adjusting for pre-divorce factors. Again, knowing that there are some, this is where it's complicated, because there are some kids who do better when their parents break up. Um, but on average, and then when we break it out with these, uh, these uh, what I call the, uh, the, the low-conflict couples, um, uh, we also have learned um, and Andrew Cherlin is a good example of, of this. He followed his 25-year longitudinal study of British kids, uh, uh, arguing early on that the effects were modest and we shouldn't overblow them, the negative effects of divorce. And then uh, when those kids were 25, he found that they were diverging, that, that the effects on psychological morale um, uh, uh, as a psychological error, th th those kids were doing worse. Uh, we now have good data on the future divorce prospects of children of divorce, that the best study of this using the best data um, suggests about a 50% greater likelihood that you will divorce yourself. And this, these sorts of things hold up even when you control for social class and other factors. And also that children of divorce tend to marry other children of divorce disproportionately. And when you have two children of divorce getting married, you have uh, a, a, a double uh, the likelihood of divorce yourself. And so it's a, we're learning about the multi-generational effects. Uh, I actually have a question for Bill about the research. Um, I, I'm not an expert, but I agree with you. We have a ton of research, good quality research now about the effects on kids. What I think we may not know enough about is that hot period when people uh, decide to get an divorce. What's going through their minds? What do they know about divorce? What do they think will happen to them and their children 
it, do we have a lot of research about no. that? My sense is that's what we need to know more about yeah. in order to tailor some of these interventions. I, I agree. And what I'm involved in uh, with our intervention project, uh, our Minnesota Couples of the Brain project, we have now worked with 60 couples uh, on the threshold of divorce, and I'm learning a ton. I'm learning a ton. Uh, the degree of up and down, in and out, ambivalence, one day in, the next day out, uh, multiple people in their lives giving them so much input. Um, it's, it's amazing. There are couples that I've worked with who we have this, what we call this discernment counseling process, and some people make the decision to go ahead with a divorce, and, and I figure they're long divorced, and I hear from them a year later. Uh, because they're, they're still hanging. We know we need to know a lot more about, I like that, that's that hot period, a whole lot more about it. Um, <clears throat> from my experience with the research in this field, it, it's very difficult to find any outcome variable where married children from married couple families don't do better from asthma to just about any variable you can think of. Uh, and that that's true even when you, you hold the income effect, uh, uh, the higher income of the married couple, uh, constant in most cases. I, I would just like to comment on one of them, which is the very, very large difference uh, in, in child abuse uh, be between married couple families where both the biological mother and father are present and any other type of family structure. Uh, there's one study from the United Kingdom where you show variation as high as 40 to 1 uh, in terms of the amount of physical abuse going on, that the, the overwhelming bulk of physical abuse is, is occurring after uh, a, a, the biological couple has separated and there's another uh, a male in the home who is not the biological parent of those children. Uh, it's a very risky situation. In many cases, it's unavoidable, but certainly it's something where we would want to take steps to try to keep that original couple together as much as possible for the well-being of the child. 